Hello everyone, my name is Bryant Robbins and I'm a civil engineer at the Risk Management Center. In this presentation, I'll give an overview of seepage and internal erosion from a historical perspective. As noted in the introduction, there's been a lot of confusion in terms of terminology used to describe internal erosion processes over the years. And this was driven largely due to the fact that there was not always common understanding of what types of processes were occurring. The overall intent of this presentation is to emphasize the importance of a site characterization and foundation assessment that is detailed and, and comprehensive enough that it informs us about the potential for internal erosion failure mechanisms that might be positioned below a dam or levee or a spillway foundation. And uh, to do this, we are going to have to describe and understand some of the geologic details and subsurface conditions and how those conditions relate specifically to internal erosion or seepage. I'm going to provide a summary, sort of an overall summary of the guiding geologic principles that help us characterize a site, hydrogeology, structural geology, um, geomorphology, we're going to understand a little bit how those disciplines all play together for assessing foundation conditions. And then we'll discuss also the soil considerations and the rock foundation considerations that relate directly to different internal erosion failure modes or the features that we need to be aware of or try to characterize. We'll also cover a few unique geologic cases so this is more specific to, for example, karst or uh, anthropogenic type of activities. So tunnels or, or drilling in and around the dam foundation or, or levee foundation that can cause problems. And then to do all this, we're gonna intermix a few case histories to use as examples that emphasize, um, em emphasize these site investigations or site characterizations that help us evaluate internal erosion failure modes for both soil and rock. In the 19th century and before, many dams were designed and constructed as part of irrigation systems. However, because the science for embankment dam design was not really developed, largely due to the absence of soil mechanics, the dams failed frequently. Empiricism governed dam designs, and as a result, dams were often greatly overbuilt. As an example of an overbuilt structure, consider the dam at Puron constructed from 700 BC to 1100 AD. This dam was a Mayan structure built in Guatemala. The crest was 55 meters wide, and the base was 105 meters wide. It was a soil masonry structure with only 20 meters of differential head. Overbuilding ensured it would last without the knowledge to properly assess it. Holding only a few meters of water originally, the seepage length was extremely conservative. Over time, the dam was gradually enlarged as experience dictated the design was safe year after year. While dams were based on empiricism during this era, Centuries of experience led to relatively modern design sections over time. As you can see from the rules of thumb used by Indian engineers, the design slopes for their embankments were not that different from what we use today in modern design. While most dams were small that they were constructing, they did build many large dams by modern standards as well. We'll take a look at some of these large dams on the next slide. This table shows a list of large earth dams constructed in India. They were referred to as tanks because the dams were constructed solely for storing off-stream um, storage for irrigation 
through diversion canals. As you can see from the numbers in the table, many of these structures were really large dams. The one highlighted had a height of 80 feet. Again, the side slopes were roughly equivalent to what we would consider today. Now, when the British arrived in India, they started to mess with these time-proven designs and failure frequencies began to increase. In the 1800s, the first step toward developing a science for dam design was made by Henry Darcy. He worked as an engineer designing municipal water systems in France and later became in charge of a laboratory through which he was able to investigate questions raised from some field installations of aquifer systems. At this time in history, head losses in pipes had just been discovered. You may recall from your undergraduate studies the Darcy-Weisbach equation for describing flow in pipes. That equation described the head loss in pipes and was named after Henry Darcy. These principles were used for designing the conveyance systems for multiple water supplies. The most desirable and commonly pursued approach for systems was as shown on this page, where a exposed spring would be covered to protect the water from being contaminated, and that water would be directed into pipes um, to convey it to the city downhill. While the head losses in the pipes were understood at this time, the common belief with groundwater aquifers was that they were infinite reservoirs through which head loss did not occur. Another method was to use artesian aquifers and add riser pipes. The riser pipe would carry the water up to the aqueduct. While working on this type of well, Darcy conducted pump tests to evaluate the well capacity. During these tests, Darcy observed different levels of drawdown at different discharges. This led him to believe the head losses were occurring in the groundwater aquifer just as they do in pipes. As a result, Darcy took careful notes of well discharge as the riser elevation was increased. He noticed a linear relationship between the riser elevation and the discharge, which led him to believe that discharge was a function of gradient. Darcy later took a position at one of the premier educational institutions in France. This gave him the opportunity to run laboratory experiments to test his ideas. He developed a device, as shown on the slide, that was quite similar to a modern permeameter. Using this device, Darcy discovered what we now refer to as Darcy's Law for describing the flow of water through soil. This was the first step towards a scientific understanding of dam design and internal erosion. In the meantime, the British had colonized and exploited India. The ability to grow valuable spices and drugs in that climate was the main driver behind colonizing the um, area, as well as the main driver behind British engineers being, becoming in, involved in irrigation works in India. British engineers spent decades building extensive irrigation networks in India. Reservoirs were still called tanks, just as they were before, um, taking on the terminology that was locally used in the country at that time. These reservoirs were typically filled using diversion weirs that were constructed across the main rivers. The British changed the typical Indian diversion wear designs by using masonry structures instead of earth to reduce the amount of labor it took to build the weirs. The masonry structures provided ideal roofing conditions for backwards erosion piping to occur in the fine foundation sands of these large rivers. As a result, failures of these weirs were very frequent. One prominent failure was the Kenki weir, which is shown on this slide. The Kanki Weir was built in 1892 and failed twice by 1895. 
These failures prompted British Colonel Claiborne to perform a series of model tests investigating what we would now call backwards erosion piping. During his studies, Colonel Claiborne looked at the concept of a global gradient or average gradient across samples and scaled models. He concluded that the average hydraulic gradient should be the basis for design. That is, if we're looking at a weir that had 10 feet of head and a 100 foot seepage length, the average gradient would be 0 0.1. Now, if we think about the average gradient in the context of the types of structures being built, we see that even with shallow cutoffs, this average hydraulic gradient theory is a pretty good approximation of the actual flow net we would expect for the types of structures being assessed. As such, calculations of uplift pressures under a weir on the basis of average gradients would be pretty close to the actual pressures experienced. Using these principles, the hydraulic gradient theory, Colonel John Claiborne and John Stuart Beresford predicted unsafe uplift pressures on the Norora Weir. Days later, after making this prediction, the weir failed. Prior to that, the weir had stood soundly for 20 years. The average hydraulic gradient was 1 over 11. What happened was the uplift pressures caused the rear apron to wash out, dropping the gradient to 1 over 9.5. As a result, piping washed out the foundation and the weir completely failed. Because of this prediction and prompt failure, hydraulic gradients quickly became the basis for design. While hydraulic gradient theory was used and formed the basis for design, the focus was really only on the uplift of the structure based on the global gradient. This is clearly reflected by the 1907 edition of Bly's book, which contains the statement, the stability of a weir on a porous foundation depends solely on the weight of the structure. However, only a few years later, the concept of piping is formally recognized and introduced for the first time in 1910. This was the first recognition of internal erosion as a failure mechanism that must be designed against in the professional literature. In his 1910 edition of his book, Bly states, the safety of a structure subjected to water pressure and founded on a porous stratum from being undermined by a gradual process of washing out of the particles of sand by the percolating undercurrent, termed piping, is thus clearly dependent on the length of the enforced percolation provided. With these ideas in mind, Bly devised a method, termed the creep ratio, to try and provide a basis for design. He relied on his extensive experience in India to devise the method the creep ratio is the inverse of the global gradient method, with the exception that there are lengths taken into consideration for vertical seepage paths. The percolation coefficient, or creep ratio C, is defined as the seepage length of the structure, which is the sum of the soil structural contact lengths, over the total head loss across the structure. Bly had studied many dams based on his experiences overseas in India and came up with empirical values for various soil types. While these values have been cited in the literature on numerous occasions, it's important to point out that they're not based on known case histories, or I should say they're based on unknown case histories. Bly's failure cases used to devise these recommendations were never found. It should also be noted that Bly's paper was the sole publication at this point in time. Therefore, it became widely used globally and formed the basis for design of many dams, even many early dams in the US.
If we summarize progress now through 1910, we can say that hydraulic gradient theory allowed for a means of crude seepage analysis to assess pressures, at least if the seepage path was predominantly horizontal. Piping was recognized as a failure mechanism separate from uplift. And the creep ratio existed as the sole guidance on allowable gradients based on global gradient for determining safety against piping. Now let's take a look at some developments in seepage analysis that occurred shortly thereafter. One of the first developments was that of flow nets. Professor Philip Forheimer developed the concept of flow nets in 1911 and formalized them as a graphical method for seepage analysis. While flow nets were developed in 1911, they did not catch on quickly, especially in the US, because the findings were published in German. It should be noted that Forheimer, Terzaghi, and Casagrande were all of German origin. Terzaghi quickly became aware of flow nets and began using them in practice as Forheimer was his former colleague and professor. We know for sure that by 1917, Terzaghi was using flow nets per uh, Casagrande 1937 paper. Around this same time, another method of solving groundwater was developed in Russia by Professor Pavlovsky. This method was called the electric analog. Because Ohm's law for electricity is the same form as Darcy's law. The solution to an electrical field is the same solution as the one for a groundwater potential field. This is illustrated on the following slide. Here you see a classic magnetic field experiment that's often used in elementary science with magnetic filings to illustrate the potential field. We can think of the lines in the um, iron filings as flow lines, and you can easily see how you could sketch equal potential lines across that field to form a flow net. While the electric analog and flow nets were developed around the same time, flow nets had a few advantages in terms of simplicity and ease of use. Terzaghi, as I mentioned, was a student and colleague of Forheimer. As a result, he became aware of this idea of flow nets um, almost immediately and began putting them to good use in practice. Terzaghi made extensive use of flow nets to study seepage problems for dams. As a result, he discovered that seepage forces are related to the hydraulic gradient critical value of the exit gradient exists at which the ground fluidizes, and flow nets can be used to assess when this condition occurs. All of this was discovered through multiple series of small-scale model tests and corresponding seepage analysis. Terzaghi also invented and patented the concept of using weighted filters to increase the allowable upstream water level. Terzaghi published these findings in 1922 in Germany. Shortly thereafter, Terzaghi came to the US and worked at MIT as a professor. During this time, Terzaghi published these findings in English in the Journal of the Boston Society of Civil Engineers. The concepts were quickly adopted and put into practice by USACE, as reflected by the work conducted in the early 1930s at both the Vicksburg Soil Mechanics Laboratories in Mississippi, the Fort Peck Laboratory that was stood up for construction of Fort Peck Dam, as well as the Muskingum Valley Soil Laboratories that were constructed in Ohio during the Public Works projects building a series of 12 dams. Walter Zaghi's introduction of flow nets and filters became widely used, they were not the only research being conducted and put into practice. 
Emery W. Lane was the administrator of Bureau of Reclamation's Hydraulic, Sediment, and Earth Materials Research Studies. At the time of doing this work, he was involved in the Boulder Canyon project where piping was a major concern. As a result of piping being a concern, Lane did an extensive study on failure case histories of and successful case histories of dams to try to revise the concept of creep ratios. As I'm sure most of you are familiar, Lane published the idea of a weighted creep ratio where the horizontal seepage lengths were given a lower weight and he proposed various values for what these creep ratios should be as a function of soil type. It should be noted that Lane was a well-educated, competent engineer, and this paper was published decades after flow nets were developed and published. Um, also, it should be noted that the design standard at the time that this was published was still Bly's creep ratio. I say all this to point out that Emery Lane was extremely well aware of flow nets and had used them quite substantially. He thought favorably of them he just had a different failure mechanism in mind when discussing the concept of piping than Casa Grande, Terzaghi, Harza, and others. Lane envisioned that construction issues would result in a less than perfect contact at the soil structure interface. As a result, preferential seepage along the contacts could wash out the structure. However, because everyone was using the term piping at this time to describe different internal erosion mechanisms, there was substantial debate about whether or not it was the seepage along the structure contacts or the flow net analyzed seepage forces near the exit that lead to failure. As a result, there were 78 pages of discussion published for this particular paper. Looking back at this, we recognize there was validity in most of the discussion points. People were just talking past each other by referring to different mechanisms. For the case where we're looking at um, leakage along a structural contact, we would now call that concentrated leak erosion. Whereas porous flow through a sand foundation initiating backwards erosion piping would be considered a completely different mechanism. That said, it is evident that the various internal erosion mechanisms were very poorly understood at this time, and we're only slightly beginning to see some recognition of concentrated leak erosion and backwards erosion piping in the literature. We can begin to get a glimpse of what the common mindsets were during this time by looking at some of the quotes of the criticisms leveraged by others against Lane's paper. Casa Grande was um, a firm believer in everything Terzaghi um, presented and became extremely well versed at using flow nets himself. He stated that he cannot agree with the general viewpoint expressed by Lane and that the basic shortcoming of Bly's method is not eliminated by the introduction of the weighted creep ratio. This statement was based on the premise that the magnitude and distribution of seepage forces near the toe, so essentially heave or initiation of movement due to vertical seepage, is what determines the safety against piping. With this in mind, Casa Grande went on and drew many examples of flow nets to illustrate how different situations with the same creep ratios can have extremely different factors of safety against heave or the initiation of backwards erosion. Similarly, Harza stated that Mathematics and the electric analogy can be relied upon to establish fundamental principles around which to build the experimental data. While those criticisms of the weighted creep ratio are legitimate if we're thinking about heave and initiation of backwards erosion at the downstream toe, 
I previously stated that the other authors were thinking about different failure mechanisms. So it's natural to ask what is the validity of the creep ratios that were presented. To get at this topic, we really need to dig into what was done. It should be noted that while there were 251 dams evaluated in the development of the weighted creep ratios, there were only 21 failures. Furthermore, there are the same number of failures in coarse sand gravel cases as there are in sand fine cases. You can see the distribution of numbers of failure that were assessed in the table on the slide. This ought to make the reader suspicious regarding the type of piping failures that are being considered because we know today that backwards erosion is obviously most prevalent in fine sands. Lane may have been correct that most of the failures in his database were caused by concentrated leak erosion along the contacts. This would clearly explain why we see just as many failures in gravel, cobbles, and boulders as we do in fine sand. To support that statement, think about the construction in gravel, cobbles, and boulders. It would have been extremely difficult to drive cutoffs in these types of materials, which would have damaged a lot of the um, closures and led to concentrated leaks through the dams. To look at this a little further, the following slides will show a few of the dams that failed to explore what type of internal erosion is being discussed, or in terms of the phrases being used at the time, what type of piping, in quotes, are we talking about? Here you see two structures that were in the gravel, cobble, and boulder failures category. Coon Rapids Dam on the left was a concrete structure supported on piles with sheet pile cutoffs. It would have been extremely difficult to obtain tight foundation structure contact everywhere, making concentrated leaks a possibility. Furthermore, since the dam was pile supported, once the concrete was in place, it's extremely likely that differential settlement would have resulted in gaps in the foundation. Similarly, Pittsfield Dam on the right was placed on a heterogeneous foundation of gravel and fine materials with weep holes and filters called out on the dam. You can see um, right here the term weep holes. It's, it's kind of hard to see because the quality of the image. And the note of the foundation material is gravel and fine material. Given the fact that there were weep holes and gravel and fine material, it's highly likely that progressive erosion of fines through the weep holes may have occurred. This ultimately would have resulted in concentrated leaks along that um, concrete foundation interface. The Plattsburgh Dam is again a concrete dam with weep holes that was placed on a boulder, gravel, and sand foundation. Once again, selective erosion of sand could have readily occurred through the weep holes. The only failure in the data set on coarse sand is the Federborn Dam in Germany, constructed as shown on this slide. This dam has a lot of embankment structure contacts with no filters. This failure could have been concentrated leak erosion or also could have been backwards erosion piping. We really don't have any way to tell. Most of the fine sand failures that were in Lane's data set occurred on weirs in India. Typical cross sections for these weirs are shown on this slide. The weir structures were typically masonry with masonry or riprap aprons on either side. The structure had a lot of structural connections. Of the failures in the list, these are the most likely to have been backwards erosion piping. However, many other contributing factors could have influenced the process. For example, leaks through masonry joints or poor initial foundation contacts due to the lack of ability to dewater completely during construction. Corpus Christi Dam was one of the two fine sand failures in the U.S. that were examined by Lane. The structure was a pile-supported concrete weir 
it actually failed at a fairly high average gradient of 0 0.32, indicating it likely had decent concrete foundation contact. It also had a drain of some sort and cutoffs that added to the internal erosion resistance. The internal erosion mechanism could have been concentrated leak erosion, backward erosion piping, or potentially both. It is readily seen that the type of internal erosion being assessed is clearly not straightforward in these old case histories. Because creep ratios and the recommended values are a combination of all types of internal erosion failures, the value should be considered with caution when being used to assess a particular type of internal erosion. Another reason to add caution is that there's been significant changes in construction practices and general designs of embankments and dams since this time. As we all know, empirical methods are only as good as your supporting data set, and if the supporting data set is substantially different than the um, designs being assessed, it is dangerous to use empirical methods. So just to reiterate Lane's thoughts on two distinct mechanisms, we can look at his closing remarks on this paper and debate. Lane said, piping failures should therefore be considered as possible from two largely independent causes. One, direct percolation through the foundation material, and two, percolation along the contact of the dam and sheet piling with the foundation material. He said creep theory considers only the second of these causes. He recognized that there was another mechanism that was not being considered in his case histories. Short path theory, or the average hydraulic gradient theory, is a rough approximation of the flow net or electrical analysis. He also said that resistance along the line of creep may be less than through the foundation on account of the difficulty of securing intimate contact. So he's acknowledging the potential for construction defects. He's continuing in that line of thinking. He says points where there is most danger of failure are likely to be those where contact between the dam and foundation is not so close. So he's saying that concentrated leak erosion is likely the most dangerous um, issue for these dams of the two mechanisms. And then finally he closes by saying, flow nets and electrohydraulic analogy may prove to be useful tools in forming a mental picture of what takes place under certain conditions. It is hoped that further studies will be made. So he acknowledged that there was value in those tools for assessing seepage but was just of the belief that the construction defects and other issues were what controlled. So just to reiterate Lane's thoughts on two distinct mechanisms, we can look at his closing remarks on this paper and debate. Lane said, piping failures should therefore be considered as possible from two largely independent causes. One, direct percolation through the foundation material, and two, percolation along the contact of the dam and sheet piling with the foundation material. He said creep theory considers only the second of these causes. He recognized that there was another mechanism that was not being considered in his case histories. Short path theory, or the average hydraulic gradient theory, is a rough approximation of the flow net or electrical analysis. He also said that resistance along the line of creep may be less than through the foundation on account of the difficulty of securing intimate contact. So he's acknowledging the potential for construction defects. He's continuing in that line of thinking. He says points where there is most danger of failure are likely to be those where contact between the dam and foundation is not so close. So he's saying that concentrated leak erosion is likely the most dangerous um, issue for these dams of the two mechanisms. And then finally he closes by saying
flow nets and electrohydraulic analogy may prove to be useful tools in forming a mental picture of what takes place under certain conditions. It is hoped that further studies will be made. So he acknowledged that there was value in those tools for assessing seepage, but was just of the belief that the construction defects and other issues were what controlled. Perhaps driven largely by the debate on Lane's paper, Casagrande wrote an excellent paper that clearly outlined the method of flow net construction for embankment dams to educate the profession on how to perform a seepage analysis. This paper was published in 1937, just a year or two later than Lane's. Due to the ease of use, flow nets quickly took off as the preferred means of performing seepage analysis after this point. We see this in a lot of the Corps of Engineers dam design reports from the following decades where there are incredibly well done seepage um, flow nets for various conditions. In Casa Grande's paper, he formalized rules for flow net construction, including those with um, exiting seepage faces and free surfaces. He also describes how to draw flow nets for anisotropic soil conditions and how to handle multiple soil layers and um, changes in permeability. So if you recall, Terzaghi's earlier papers on erosion were focused on heave and pre uh, preventing heave with weighted filters. It wasn't until later when Terzaghi became aware of a case history in Memphis that was clearly backwards erosion piping that he starts to distinguish between just this initiating mechanism of heave and the overall process of backwards erosion. In 1931, he published a paper titled Earth Slips and Subsidences from Underground Erosion that documented this Memphis case history. Now the case history consisted of a perched sand layer that was deposited on the banks of the Mississippi River near Memphis. In this case history, that sand layer was charged as the river level raised by seepage from the river. And the river levels quickly resided, which caused that um, water in the perched sand layer to flow back to the river. As the water flowed back to the river, it carried with it a large portion of that sand layer and caused um, surface settlements to occur along the bank. Of... The observations from that case history were astonishing to Terzaghi due to the magnitude of the settlements. If I recall correctly, a section of the bank that was hundred or hundreds of feet long settled 20 or 30 feet, and there was no sign of where the material went. This made Terzaghi realize that there was a subsurface process that could move material rather quickly. As a result, he begins to delineate different types of internal erosion. As you can see here, he says in his paper that a process of subterranean erosion apt to occur at surprisingly low hydraulic gradients is what was responsible for that bank subsidence. This is the beginning of acknowledging the process of backwards erosion piping as a um, completely independent mechanism to heave in the literature written by Terzaghi. Terzaghi clearly delineated this difference between heaving backwards erosion piping in his book, Soil Mechanics and Engineering Practice, that was published in 1948. This was one of the first widely used soil mechanics books in the US, and so it gained widespread attention and use. For the first time, the two distinct failure mechanisms of heave versus backwards erosion piping were recognized. We see in this quote, Terzaghi says, under certain conditions discussed in the following paragraphs, 
the percolating water may produce one of two phenomena. Either the seepage pressure may lift the entire body of soil located along the downstream toe, so that's referring to heave, an uplift of the soil, or else the water that comes out of the ground at the downstream toe may start a process of erosion that culminates in the formation of a tunnel-shaped passage or pipe, so we're talking about backwards erosion, piping, beneath the structure. A mixture of soil and water then rushes through the passage, undermining the structure and flooding the channel below the dam. Failures of either type are known as failures due to piping, so you can see we still have lumping of everything under this term piping. The first type has been referred to as failure by heave, and the second as failure by subsurface erosion. While he's delineating these two as separate processes, the connection that heave may just prompt subsurface erosion or piping still has not been recognized. For the first time, the two distinct failure mechanisms of heave versus backwards erosion piping were recognized. We see in this quote, Terzaghi says, under certain conditions discussed in the following paragraphs, the percolating water may produce one of two phenomena. Either the seepage pressure may lift the entire body of soil located along the downstream toe, so that's referring to heave, an uplift of the soil, or else the water that comes out of the ground at the downstream toe may start a process of erosion that culminates in the formation of a tunnel-shaped passage or pipe, so we're talking about backwards erosion, piping, beneath the structure. A mixture of soil and water then rushes through the passage, undermining the structure and flooding the channel below the dam. Failures of either type are known as failures due to piping, so you can see we still have lumping of everything under this term piping. The first type has been referred to as failure by heave, and the second as failure by subsurface erosion. While he's delineating these two as separate processes, the connection that heave may just prompt subsurface erosion or piping still has not been recognized. So if we stop here and summarize through 1948, we see that piping, still as a whole category, has been separated into two mechanisms, heave and subsurface erosion, which refers to backwards erosion piping. In modern context, we would consider heave as an initiating mechanism for other internal erosion processes. Usually backwards erosion piping is what follows it though. As we noted earlier, concentrated leak erosion has also kind of been recognized in lane studies. However, at this point in time, there has been no clearly written work that delineates backwards erosion piping and concentrated leak erosion as two distinct separate internal erosion mechanisms. Now, in the 1950s, we start to see some very different thinking regarding concentrated leaks. While Lane was thinking of concentrated leak erosion along masonry dam contacts or concrete soil interfaces, at that time most people thought that um, it wasn't really possible to get leaks in embankment dams because they can't crack. It wasn't until Casa Grande published a paper in 1950 that the possibility of cracks and concentrated leak erosion in dams really began to be considered. At that time, it was thought that really large differential settlements would be required to crack embankments. However, through two case histories where embankment dams cracked without large settlements, Casa Grande began to point out that concentrated leaks and erosion can occur just through the soil materials in an embankment. This idea of cracking in embankment dams was really driven home by James Sherrard. Sherrard was Terzaghi's PhD student, and he presented six more cases of cracking in embankment dams. These case histories clearly illustrated that embankment dams could crack and fail due to concentrated leak erosion. 
As a result of this, concentrated leak erosion was recognized as a major internal erosion failure mechanism at this time. Additionally, the importance of filters for preventing erosion was reiterated. This led to the use of chimney filters everywhere to allow for seepage to be collected and managed at a known filtered location in the dam section. It was recognized that the only way to prevent erosion was to completely control where water exited from the structure and ensure those exits were protected with weighted filters. Basically, Terzaghi and others recognized that the seepage had to be forced to a point where we can make the problem uh, um, accessible by turning it into a weighted filter problem. So this did a lot to emphasize that complete filtration was needed in dams and that filters were the only true means to design against internal erosion. Sherard continued work on this um, type of thing and performed a lot of work for the NRCS, which was responsible for dam construction in the Midwestern USA. It also happens that this area contains a lot of dispersive soils. Because there were quite a few failure case histories on these dispersive soils, they did evaluations and it was recognized that dispersive soils would erode more quickly than other soils, which could lead to concentrated leak erosion being more likely. As a result, again, the importance of using complete filters and dams was reiterated. To date, we have seen how the profession came to an understanding of backward erosion piping, including the recognition that initiation and heave are different than the erosion process itself. We have also seen the major drivers that lead to the recognition of concentrated leak erosion as a primary internal erosion mechanism as well. Another mechanism often discussed in the literature is internal instability. This was studied early on in Eastern Europe and Russia with grading criteria for stable soils being developed. However, it wasn't until Sherard attributed the formation of sinkholes to internal instability in 1979 that this mechanism garnered significant attention in the US. While this mechanism is widely studied due to the ease with which laboratory tests can be conducted, even to this day, that's probably the most prevalent type of internal erosion work done, no failure case histories have been definitively attributed to internal instability. So this includes suffusion or suffusion. Um, so while there's a lot of work that's been done, we need to acknowledge um, realistically how significant it is. And at the very least, we should be aware of this work in a historical context so that we can clearly identify what historical studies are internal instability focused versus concentrated leak erosion or backwards erosion piping. Um, especially since the term piping for those early studies was used to describe all of it. The last mechanism that we need to talk about is contact erosion. So there really aren't a lot of case histories where this has been an issue in dams and levees either, but bronze was interested in the potential for erosion to occur in layered systems like we were building for filters. As a result, he developed a lab test and published the results, and the concept of contact erosion was thus defined by his study, along with initial criteria for defining when erosion occurs and when it does not. So in summary, all four internal erosion mechanisms were recognized by 1980s, concentrated leak erosion, backward erosion piping, internal instability to include suffusion and suffusion, and contact erosion, or sometimes called scour. The terminology remained extremely inconsistent, however, until 2007 when groups got together and started to try to standardize. 
Using consistent terminology is extremely important to ensure we understand the internal erosion process being described to us so that we're on the same page in terms of discussing contributing factors and that we're also all using proper analysis techniques associated with each mechanism. Looking forward from this point in time, from 1980 to 2000, a significant amount of work was done by Selmeyer and Schmertman to develop approaches for predicting backward erosion piping. Also, it should be noted that from 1997 to 2008, a large body of work was done by Fell and Mark Foster and others to develop quantitative and semi-quantitative methods for assessing backward erosion piping concentrated leak erosion, and filter performance. There'll be much more to come on these topics in future sessions.